You might be wondering how a lecture about fungal infections could be so interesting. Well, I'll be telling you about situations that could place any of us at risk of acquiring a fungal infection, even events as benign as creating a flower arrangement or going on a camping trip. Let's start learning about fungal infections with a camping trip scenario. Let's imagine you're going to spend part of your summer vacation with your son or grandson on a Boy Scout trip to northern Wisconsin. Now, this trip includes several nights at a camp near the Eagle River. The camp has 40 acres of pine and hemlock forest, and there are over 6,000 visitors to the camp annually who participate in all types of outdoor activities, including lectures and ecology projects. There are four cabins for overnight guests, and the meals are prepared and served in the dining hall on the campgrounds. Let's also suppose that six or eight weeks after your stay, your son or grandson becomes ill with a fever, a dry cough, and chest pain. He's taken to his pediatrician, where a diagnosis of walking pneumonia is made, and he's prescribed an erythromycin-based antibiotic. Several of the boy's friends, who are also scouts, are ill with similar symptoms. However, the families don't make much of this connection since the boys are frequently playing together. A health officer at the Wisconsin Public Health Department is getting an unusual number of case reports of elementary school students visiting their primary care physicians with fever, severe cough, chest pain, and this diagnosis of, quote, walking pneumonia. Eventually, sputum specimens are coughed up from several sick children that show an unusual finding under the microscope. Chest x-rays are taken and reveal multiple nodular appearing spots in the lungs. What's your diagnosis? Do you think it's a virus, a bacteria? We'll make our diagnosis a little bit later. Although fungal diseases usually don't involve humans, they can indirectly involve humans and they've played a major role in human history. A less well-known outbreak of disease, the Irish potato famine began in 1845. The fungus killed off Ireland's potato crops and more than a million people died of starvation and illness brought on by malnutrition. The potato was the basic staple in the Irish diet so when potatoes turned into a slimy, decaying pile of rot, many theories abounded. One was that this was a result of static electricity from the new railroad locomotives. But actually, the cause was an airborne fungus that had traveled from Mexico to Ireland in the holds of ships traveling to Ireland. The fungus was destroying the roots of the potato plant. And even back then, Global trade was affecting the health of people all over the world. Besides hunger, many people died from diseases associated with malnutrition, which indirectly causes deficiencies in the immune system, making those affected more prone to infectious diseases. In 1861, a scientist proved that a fungus caused the blight disease the fungus still causes disease in potatoes in other countries. A more destructive fungal strain than the 1840s Irish potato one is threatening potato fields in Russia. Now, fungi are eukaryotic cells containing a nucleus and many organelles. These are more complicated life forms. They require oxygen to live and fungi are structurally divided into yeasts, similar to the yeast used in baking bread, and molds, the green circles on moldy pieces of bread in the refrigerator, or blocks of cheese that you find in the back of the refrigerator. Molds are actually composed of many hyphal elements. Now, hyphae are thread-like branching tubules composed of fungal cells attached end to end. Most fungi are either a yeast or a mold. However, 
There are some fungi that are dimorphic. They exist in one shape in the human body and a different shape in laboratory culture media. A yeast is a unicellular form of fungal growth. These cells can appear spherical or elliptical, and they reproduce by budding. Spores are the reproducing bodies of molds. Cell membranes of fungi are also more complex than those of bacteria. The outer cell contains a building block called ergosterol. Now, ergosterol is similar in structure to cholesterol, which is an ingredient of human cell membranes. This can be important since some antifungal medications may have side effects that are associated with the structural similarity between ergosterol and cholesterol. Now, here's a personal example of a fungal infection that could happen to almost anyway. Years ago, the Yale golf coach called me on the phone saying that both of his hands had swollen to enormous proportions such that he could no longer even grip a golf club. He had returned four weeks earlier from teaching younger golfers in St. Andrews, Scotland, where he uncharacteristically had plodded through the Scottish heather looking for their golf balls. Complaining to his primary physician, he had received a course of oral antibiotics, but his hands were not getting any better. Over the phone, I was suspicious about a fungal infection, since he had many scratches on the back of his hands from the Scottish heather bushes, and he had not responded to antibiotics. Now, since he was returning to St. Andrews for more golf instruction in a few weeks, it was imperative that I help him with his diagnosis and treatment. I called in a long distance prescription for an antifungal medication, and after four weeks of treatment, I was pleased to find out that he was cured. And I'll explain this fungal condition shortly. Fungal infections are generally characterized by the depth of invasion into the human body. There are surface based skin infections infections underneath the skin, body-wide infections associated with specific geographic areas, and then infections in patients with compromised immune systems. I'd now like to introduce you to the fungal infections of the skin surfaces and of hair and nails. These are known as dermatophytes. These fungi live in the dead outside layers of the skin, hair, and the nails. Now, keratin is the primary structural protein of these body components. And dermatophytes secrete an enzyme, keratinase, which partially digests layers of these body components. The disruption of keratin causes the loss of hair, scaling of the skin, and crumbling of the nails. And when the nails are involved, the term is known as onychomycosis. This leads to thickened, discolored, and brittle nails. Fungal nail infections do become more prevalent as we age, and about half of adults over the age of 70 are affected. Superficial fungal infections are also nicknamed as tinea. So, tinea corporis forms a ring shape with a red raised border and is known as ringworm. When these dermatophytes involve the scalp, they're known as tinea capitis. When they involve the foot, they're known as tinea pedis, causing, quote, athlete's foot. The athlete's foot causes cracking and peeling of skin between the toes. Moving deeper into the skin, subcutaneous fungal infections usually enter the body following injury to the skin rather than a digestive enzyme. They usually remain localized to the tissues just below the top layers of the skin or spread to local lymph nodes. One important yeast that can cause an either superficial or subcutaneous fungal infection is known as Candida albicans. And Candida species, like bacteria, are part of the body's normal microbiota. When antibiotics can kill the bacteria, but not the yeast, Candida can take over 
and expand their growth without competition. Candida causes diaper rash in newborns, as well as overgrowth in the vaginal area after antibiotics while leading to a white discharge. Or sometimes we see a white pattern in the mouth known as oral thrush after antibiotic therapy. Candida can also be involved in body-wide infections in patients who are hospitalized and subjected to extensive antibiotic therapy and invasive medical devices such as intravenous catheters. Now, the Yale golf coach's hand infections were caused by sporotrichosis, considered a subcutaneous yeast. But I'd like to tell you a slightly different story about this fungus. In Wisconsin, several years ago, the health department was notified of four employees at a garden center with suspected sporotrichosis. All four were involved in making floral arrangements for grave sites. Each had developed an ulcerative lesion on the hand or the wrist that was originally thought to be a bacterial infection. Next, they developed an ascending infection of the lymph system and fungal cultures from the lymph nodes grew sporothrix. When investigators finally connected the dots, the four employees were cured with an oral antifungal medicine known as ketoconazole. So, what was the common culprit? Well, samples of the sphagnum moss used during the production of the floral arrangements at the garden center were tested and were positive for sporothrix. The sphagnum moss had been harvested from bogs located in central Wisconsin and was purchased from one wholesale dealer. Other cases in the Midwest occurred related to the distribution of the moss. Now this case suggests that workers in contact with moss could reduce their risk of acquiring disease by wearing protective clothing, but particularly protective gloves. Sporotrichosis can also result from injuries associated with handling of contaminated firewood or rose thorns. So if you're a gardener, you should take extra care and wear gloves while handling roses. As an infectious disease clinician, I have had one case of even a snowmobile driver who acquired sporotrichosis after scraping against a rusty fence in the middle of winter. Eventually this progressed to disease, which wasn't diagnosed until the springtime. <laughs>